evening. Welcome to the Zoning Board of Appeals, Scarborough, November 9th, 2016. Ms. Shoup? Here. Mr. Blaze? Mr. Hebert? Here. Mr. Maroon? Here. Mr. Stark? Here. Mr. Crockett? Here. Mr. Richard? Okay, we have members of voting members. Uh, just, uh, so, oh, Pledge of Allegiance, please. <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <coughs> Thank you, Ron. Um, first thing is, we've got a nope. letter from... Over there first, okay. Yes. Well, I have a motion for approval of the minutes for October 12th, uh, 2016. Motion to approve is presented. Second. Second. Any discussion on the motion? Move to me. All favor? Jim. Thank you. And we've got a request for. Uh, I'll read it in quickly. <coughs> uh, this is from uh, the Haskells. Right on behalf of my husband, David Haskell, and sister Dar uh, Sarah Douglas. We made a presentation in their September meeting on nine shipwrecks. Uh, we'd like to postpone the next uh, to schedule on December 14th meeting to allow us time to properly complete our revised sub uh, submission. And so, uh, if anybody has no problem with that, we'll put that on the agenda for the, the December 14th meeting. Is that okay with you? Okay, fine. So we'll do that. Okay, great. And I'm going to start right with only two appeals tonight. Appeal number uh, 2591, it's a practical difficulty variance. Request by Abigail, uh, Abigail Kane, One Hillside Avenue, process, uh, Sisters Map U27, parcel 74. And do we have representatives? Okay. Okay. Excuse me, sir. Take the microphone, state your name, address, and we'll go from there. Uh, my name is Jeff Quirk, um, 123 Old Will Point Road, Scarborough, and I'm here to work with Abigail on her appeal. Um, thanks for hearing us tonight. Um, Abigail's situation is that she uh, grew up in the house. We were actually neighbors. I lived on, on Hillside as well as a kid. And uh, she inherited the house a couple of years ago. Her mom and dad have passed. And she does a lot of volunteer work with um, elderly people. And she um, is very aware of the aging process. Uh, when her dad first got sick, she was in a position that she couldn't bring him home because the house wasn't um, set up to be accessible for a wheel, wheelchair. And it's a typical 1960 ranch, a real tiny kitchen and small entryways. And what she's asking the board for is an opportunity to, um, as you can see on the um, plan, to make the back of the house um, accessible from the driveway. It's uh, no room for a garage, so her wish is that she'd be able to drive into the driveway, um, ha currently have a set of stairs, and when the need arises, uh, replace the stairs with a ramp and give her good access to the back of the house. The, uh, the way the land lays out is it, it kind of slopes pretty drastically from the foundation to, <coughs> to uh, the Pine Point Road. And with the um, handicap accessible part, she'd like to put a mudroom on the back Again, 1960s ranch with no closets and no space. She'd like to um, uh, have an area for coats and that, that type of stuff. Um, on the uh, drawing that you just saw on the, uh, um, the layout, it didn't fully show that in the very front, we'd be seeking for three feet as well to connect the existing stairs that were there with the uh, ramp that would allow us, or the piece of decking that would allow us to get to the back. So that was one of the questions. So um, we would ask for three feet by eight feet in the very front. The, it's, a, it's currently, the building is 42 and a half feet from uh, Hillside Avenue. So we'd like to reduce that just to connect the uh, existing stairs with the new piece of uh, decking that would allow access to the back of the house as well. Um, the overhangs are on the uh, the roof line are incorporated within the uh, setback that we're asking for the reduction. So uh, there's a um, on the on the 
Yeah, thank you. Um, that part right there, that the overhang is included um, in the overall reduction as well. Does that extend past the, the, the railing or is it straight with it? Um, it's just going to be the rake trim beyond that, so it will be six inches just beyond that. But that's in within what we're asking for. That's incorporated. It's, it's not going to be a, a drastic overhang, just be a, a rake trim with a shadow board. No, that's, uh, that's pretty much entails it. Um, actually, Mr. Cork addressed Mr. Cork addressed the two concerns that I had, which I put in my staff comments, and it was just sort of something that I discovered as I was reviewing the information. It wasn't clear to me whether or not it would require right. a little bit of relief on the front in order to connect. Yeah, to exactly. And yeah. Uh, and I didn't know for sure if. Uh, if the roof projection was going to be within the, the requested setback or not. So he's clarified those two points. I think everything else, um, as he described it, is pretty pretty clear. Uh, the structure did receive a variance some years ago for the little uh, bump out, the kitchen bump out that you see on this, in this view here. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then I, I believe the intent is to extend that roof right on over. The yeah, and that was just to keep the snow and the ice off. That, that part gets pretty heavily covered. And she has two front setbacks as part of the problem, right? Um, well, actually... Yeah, because of the corner lot. Yeah, yeah that, that, that's, the, that's the bugger on that, that corner lot, which obviously is on the Pine Point Road side, and there's a, a pretty good tree barrier there now. Of course, we wouldn't get into any of that. Brian, would this fall under the ADA at all? Um, not at this point, because they're not actually installing a ramp. Okay. A uh, couple of quick questions before I throw it over to the board. 36 inches, normally it's 42 for handicaps. Is there any reason why you want to stick to 36 or...? Just, we, we just didn't want to go too far with the variant. I mean, we, of course we'd like to go wider, but we're just trying to be as reasonable as we can. We measured kind of with what we could get through with a wheelchair, and that was like the bare minimum. The, the only reason I bring that up, and I don't know how that affects things, I don't know, that's good, I'm responsible for this, but to me, if we're following, if this is designed to meet the ADA regulations, we might as well meet the ADA regulations, which is 42 inches. If a single family dwelling is not required to meet ADA, and 36, 36, 36 is wide enough. Is it wide enough? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go through the requirements of practical difficulty and then we'll come to the board's questions. I'll just read them in and you can answer for me, okay? Okay, thanks. Uh, the need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not the general conditions in the neighborhood. Yeah. Um, Go ahead and read it. You can read it. Read oh, it. I... Yeah. And if you just put, yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Sometimes you Uh, yes, uh, and, and this is Abigail. I'm just reading for her, but um, she's, she states, uh, she's seeking a variance on the Pine Point Road side of my house, which has a heavily wooded tree buffer along the proposed variance size. The side of the variance that she's asking for is a strip four feet wide by 24 inches long, uh, by 24 feet, um, because her father added the bump out on the kitchen in the 1980s. The reduction requested is 12 foot 9 on the back sideline of the Pine Point Road side and 15 2 on the front sideline of the Pine Point Road. Um, again, the, uh, uh, the purpose of the variance is to make the home handicap accessible for her, her future. Her parents bought the house in 1960. She spent most of her childhood there. Um, obviously, both of her parents have passed. Um, I guess that kind of summarizes that answer. Uh, the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably de detrimental effect on either the fair market value of abutting properties of the neighborhood. No, we, we don't believe at all. Um, it will enhance the property and um, it, will, it will bring it way more into compliance than it currently is now. And with this renovation, she'd like to do a roof and other stuff as well. 
needs to be updated. So um, it would certainly not um, decrease anybody's property value. And practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner? No. Yeah. Uh, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except a variance? Uh, we looked at a lot of different ways, Mark, and, and to get to the back of the house, this is the only real feasible way that would would really work. And the reason for the back of the house versus the front of the house is? Again, it's a 1960s ranch, and it, as you come into the house, it comes right into a bottleneck. The back is, is way more open, and uh, the way the kitchen's laid out, um, if we went through the front, it would basically have to rearrange the entire kitchen, which was fairly new. So... I'm assuming that you don't have a six you probably don't have a six foot circle in there. Not at all. Okay. But that, that to me is we're dealing with this is similar in my family and in my office. So I'm pretty concerned about it. And so whether True. or not it's legal or not, to me it's important. Yeah. There's so many people need it. Uh no, uh, let's see. The uh, grant variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with the surrounding properties. Yeah, I, again, um, it, it just as, as far as accessibility, for sure. And uh, it's not an unreasonable uh, adverse effect on the natural environment. No, not at all. No. And you're not in the flood zone. No. Flood zone. Okay. And uh, anything else you could say? Want to open up the board for uh, questions or comments? It's um, pretty straightforward. The reason why you're not putting the ramp in immediately is just because it's not needed immediately. Right. And she does do a lot with elderly, and we may have an option later on if she's bringing people home. She does a lot of um, therapy stuff with, with elderly, and if we find that she's bringing people home to the house to enjoy a, a day in sun, then we'll install the ramp instead of the stairs. But right right now, obviously, she she doesn't need the the ramp. Is that um, if from a timing point of view, if we approve it and there's only stairs, but say two years from now she needs to put a ramp in, will this approval allow her to do that without having to come back? State statute allows a disability variance to be granted by a code enforcement officer, so it doesn't even have to come to the board if she needs to put a ramp in. Okay. That was kind of, I think, Mr. Stone's dark special yeah. ramp. Okay, good. So that's good to hear. So you're setting yourself up to be able to do it. But, uh, in the future, yeah. Enforcement can deal with it without us. Perfect. Okay. Um, other questions, comments from the board? Uh, I want to clarify. I mean, she can't put the ramp in until you have an actual disability documented. Is that correct? Yeah, there's some, there's criteria with the state. Okay. Statute. Okay. I just want to understand that. <coughs> Any other questions? Okay. I just one comment. Thank you for taking care of people like that. It makes a big difference. Uh, we've had numerous people in my family in wheelchairs, so understand it very well. Great. Um, okay. So I have a motion. Move to approve uh, as requested. Second. I would, I would just, oh, we want to make sure that you go back and do your findings and conclusions okay. um, as part of the decision making process. Thank you. Okay. So let's go right through the items again, like we uh, normally do. This is when they get cut and dry like this. I kind of forget the, the technical side. So let me do this. The need for the variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. Um, <coughs> I'll, I'll speak for the board and if they want to add something, uh, otherwise I speed up a bit here. Obviously, it's the property's got two side setbacks that are, are front, I'm sorry, front setbacks. And that causes most of the problem, not all of it. Um, anybody want to add anything to that? Does everybody agree no, with I think that? that's pretty good, yeah. I want to figure that being that. Okay. Uh, the granting of variance will not reproduce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not unreasonably detrimental effect on either the uh, use of the fair market value of abutting properties. It's a, it's a it, yeah. it appears to me that they're going to upgrade uh, other areas of the house as well, so it's actually going to make it a little bit nicer for the neighborhood. Right. Be an improvement. Okay. No. And any other discussion on that? All in favor of that being met? That's unanimous. <coughs> the, practical, the practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. 
so long as you don't trip intentionally, I guess that meets that requirement. Anybody have any problem with that? All in favor? The granted variance will uh, result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. It actually really doesn't fit perfectly in any category, but from a practical point of view, as the community gets older, we're going to see more of these. Um, does anybody have any questions on that or to add to that? Okay, well, I'm in favor of that being met. Uh, the granted variance will not have an unreasonable effect on the uh, natural environment. I, I see very little disturbance there. Okay. Did we skip over no feasible alternative? Yeah, yes, I did. Thank you. Four. Uh, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except the variance. And uh, based on the circumstances as I see it, and we mentioned the question about whether they come in the front door, and you really, the six feet is an exaggeration. You need six feet to turn a wheelchair in it with any reasonability. And if that's not there, you're talking about a major change. So that's true stating on the record. Um, to me, there isn't any feasible. I'll also add to that uh, note in the, uh, uh, the application here that uh, the best accessibility and most architecturally pleasing is from the rear of the building and also ties in with the, um, uh, the uh, number two as far as detrimental effect on the property, You're putting everything behind the house, you know, having everything in front of the house. So that's uh, good. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Longstaff, I always have questions on this one. I apologize. No feasible alternative. We're looking at this for doing this exact, what they're looking to do, not in the fact of no feasible alternative would be that they could not do it. Correct? Right. The interpretation that we, we've applied to this in the past is to stay consistent is that it is a permitted use in the, in the district. Um, what they're what they're uh, uh, you know uh, proposing to do it it's a permitted use in the district it's simply that they can't do it without need of a variance in order to uh, combat the, the the two burdens on the lot with having the two frontages so in other words if you didn't have that burden you would be able to maintain a 15 foot side setback where pine point road is and you could easily do this without a variance it's a permitted use in the zone they're not looking to to put up a a four-story tower or anything like that. It's it's something that could be permitted but can't be but for the fact that they need the variance. So the feasible alternative gets to how can you do what they're proposing to do without a variance. Okay. Thank you. <coughs> That's awesome. Anybody wish to add to that? You can fall in favor of that being met? Thank you. And then... Uh, <coughs> good job. Thank you. And you and Leroy. I take my glasses off. I lose my spot. Uh, the property is not located in the whole part of, of the Shoreland area. It's not in the No. No Shoreland zones, but that doesn't apply. Um, okay. So you want me to come back to it? I think we have a... Mr. Stark had a motion. Oh, before, before we do that, just one quick thing. I know Ms. had a um, question on the the ramp and I know you understand that you just can't do that you need to come oh absolutely you have to have a reason yeah okay no yeah thank you yeah we're yeah now, as far as I understand just for the record that reason is pretty pretty much like she was bringing people over that would be another of a reason I believe is that accurate um I'm not sure because I don't have the statute in front of me I just know that there is state statute that allows for good reason for for reasons that are stated in the statute. Gotcha. Um, for us to be able to do that. If there was a request to do it and it didn't meet those criteria, then they'd probably have to come to the board for another variance to do that. Is there any logic in putting it in now? Or they don't have it. You can't really, it's hard to do because it's not proposed on the plan. We don't know where it would be located. It's kind of hard to, to redraw it on the on fly, so I think we'll just... I think it's better to cross. Yeah, I'd be pretty happy with that. And we did discuss that if she started bringing um, people home, I could do a, um, a removable ramp that could sure. I could actually clip on right over the stairs as need be, and then just remove it. So that's, that's what we do. Yeah, yeah. So that was that was one of the thoughts that we had. Great. I just had one other comment, Mr. Chairman. 
um, I think we need to also discuss um, the practical difficulty um, definition. Okay. Uh, so in uh, the dimensional standards, those are provisions of, of the ordinance which relate to the lot area, lot coverage, frontage, and setback, including the buffer requirements. And then the practical difficulty, a case where a strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which the variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone, which you've already answered for us, thank you, uh, and which is located and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant. And I appreciate you bringing that up for obvious reasons. Um, so, as far as I see it, remodeling a kitchen to be able to get that six. For anybody that doesn't know, it, they use a six foot radius. Actually, six feet. Six feet. Oh, six five feet. Yeah. Five feet. Thank you. It's a circle that they just need to flow with in the wheelchair. And if you don't have that, if it's smaller than that, it can be smaller, <coughs> but it's not easy. Yeah. Um, and so it would cost to move a kitchen design and expensive. You're talking plumbing, electrical, counters, everything else. That's not cheap. Um, does anybody have anything that they'd like to add to that as far as economic injury? I think Ms. Longstaff stated perfectly that it's permitted in the zone. And so I'd like his comments on record. No, I, th I think that, they, uh, th that that was addressed you know, when he said that they did look at an alternative uh, options on this and that, that that was the reason that they didn't use the front option. So we'll go back to the motion of us if we could just restate the motion for Yeah, uh, yeah, look to approve as presented. Second. Any discussion on the motion? And all favor. That chance. Thank you very much. I see you I'll see you in hockey. Thank you. Yeah. The next variance is a, uh, it's number 2593. It's a practical difficulty variance request by Thomas Roach, 40 Morning Street, Sisters Map U2, parcel 43. And good to see you. Thank you. Hey, Mr. Chairman, my name is Nancy St. Clair. I'm with St. Clair Associates. I'm here tonight with Thomas Roach, and we'd like to talk to you folks about a request for a practical difficulty variance for his property at 40 Morning Street, which is in the Higgins Beach area. Of Scarborough. So this property has some history, and if you have read through the 12 pages of uh, narrative that I provided for you, uh, you'll know a little bit about the background on that, but I did want to hit some of the highlights uh, as part of that uh, for our discussion tonight. So this piece of property is a corner lot. In 1989, uh, Mr. Roche's grandfather was before you folks uh, to seek a variance in order to be able to build on this lot. It was a grandfathered non-conforming lot of record at the time, and due to the setbacks at the time, the building window on the lot would have been roughly about five feet by about 55 feet. Uh, so as part of the uh, review process that went on at that time, there was a variance that was granted. It's partly because of the size of the lot, but also the location of the lot in that it is a corner lot. So at the time, the uh, property located on the corner of Greenwood and 
Morning Street had a 30-foot setback from both Greenwood and Morning Street. So we had quite a bit of uh, setbacks on the fact that it was a corner lot. So as part of that 1989 variance, there was an allowance to be able to build a home on the property and impact the setback along Greenwood and also along uh, this side of the property as well. So that side yard setback, which had been 15, was reduced down to 10. The front yard setback, I believe, was reduced down to about 16 in order to be able to construct the home. Part of the discussion during the Board of Appeals review at that time was the placement of the home on the lot in the context of the fact that at that time, that reduction on that side yard setback would put the home closer to the existing house on the adjacent property. So one of the solutions for that at the time was to actually set this house back further on the lot. At that time, the setback off of Morning Street was 30 feet, well in excess of 30 feet now uh, with the construction of the home at that time in 1990. So at the time, the house had a variance that allowed construction within the setback off Greenwood and the setback off the side here of the property as well. The house was situated purposely on this side of the lot, honoring a 15-foot setback that was appropriate at the time, leaving a better separation distance between the house and the existing home that was here. If you look at an aerial photo, and I don't know, Brian, if you do have access to the aerial photos Unless um, you provided one. I, I did not, and I do apologize for that. I could probably get to one, but... If you are familiar with that particular area, you'll recall that most of the homes, especially along Morning Street, sit relatively close to the road. So in 2015, when the new zoning took effect in this area, and we're in the Coastal Residential 1 zone now, what happened was most of the homes in that area actually sit closer to the road and have a larger <coughs> rear yard. So the new setback requirements that took effect in 2015 now have both a minimum and a maximum. Being a corner lot, we're also dealing with a primary front yard, which is off Morning Street, and a secondary front yard off of Greenwood. So what we're dealing with is off Morning, we have an 18-foot minimum we have a 21-foot maximum. Right now, the house is sited approximately between 53 and 55 feet from Morning Street. So we're well in excess of the maximum allowable uh, under the new zoning. In addition, we're dealing with, as most of the lots in that area have a large rear yard, the new zoning sets forth a 30-foot rear yard setback. So along this edge where we are 15 feet from the property line, that is now a 30-foot rear yard setback. So the house, half the house, is in that setback already. So we are in a situation where in 1989, when the first variances were granted, we were addressing accommodating setbacks on both of these sides of the, the property. And in order to address that, the house was sited on this side of the lot, further away from Morning Street. If you look at the photos on the aerial, you'll see that the majority of the homes along Morning Street do sit pretty close <coughs> uh, to the road, and this one actually sits quite a ways back. So we're dealing with a situation, and you've got it right there, there's the, the house. So that's the house sitting sort of further back, and you can see all these of the long map of the front yard here. Can you zoom out? <coughs> not. If I could, I would have. <laughs> <laughs> Don't be so critical. You got what you got. <laughs> Can you click on that one particular parcel? And I then? can't. Oh. I, it doesn't do anything. Um, okay. If I had the internal GIS that I use, which right. is far superior to what I've got on the screen, I could, use, yeah. but I can't do right. that. Okay. This is so as good as it gets. Yeah. Yeah. That's, right. <laughs> That's right. So we start with an existing corner lot that up until 2015 we had a house that was situated with appropriate variances 
in the setback off of Greenwood and the setback off the side yard. With the changes that happened in 2015 with the new zoning, we are now, we would no longer need any variance because that 15 foot setback along the side is now actually only eight feet with the current zoning, so we're good. The same on Greenwood, we have again that varying minimum to maximum, which is uh, 12 to 21 feet, or about 16 feet. So again, we're good. The problem is now on the other two sides. So what we have now is a situation where the existing house sits roughly halfway in that 30 foot rear setback along the side, <coughs> and we're much further away than the maximum that will be allowed for the front yard setback for the property. What the applicants are proposing to do with their home is to actually lift it up. It is sitting on a frost wall with a crawl space. What we'd like to be able to do is raise the house up by about four feet so that that is a, a full height basement underneath the home. There was ledge that was encountered uh, as part of the construction of the home originally, so that's why there was a crawl space that was put in there uh, at that time. As part of those renovations as well, this lighter area that you see, which is roughly 12 feet by 22 feet, is a proposed addition which would provide a sunroom and a deck above uh, for that uh, expansion on the what would be the Morning Street side. So with the proposal, we're actually getting the house closer to conformity with the separation distance <coughs> maximum yeah. off of Morning Street, but we can't meet that maximum of uh, 21 feet off of Morning Street. If we were to do that, we'd end up with a house that'd be about 63 feet long. So what we're proposing to do uh, tonight is to, to seek a review by you folks for a practical difficulty variance to allow the house to be elevated by four feet so it sits in its normal original position, but because it's 15 feet in that rear yard setback, we do need to have a practical difficulty variance on that component. In addition, we need to have a variance in order to allow us to expand towards Morning Street, making it more conforming than what it is currently. But under the uh, criteria under the new zoning, additions are permitted in the side and the rear of a house, but the front expansion is not specifically allowed. So I wanted to talk to you folks about that and sort of the variance review process as well. So there is quite a bit of history on the lot as I've described. We're proposing to do what we feel is relatively straightforward and simple in order to uh, be able to allow the applicant to retire to this home, live there uh, permanently. This, this property has been in their family for decades and generations. And this started off as a, a lot that was rented for tenting. Uh, back in the, the history of Higgins Beach. And as the family um, continued to summer there, every summer they actually purchased the lot. And then that was purchased, I believe, in 1922. And then, as I mentioned, in uh, 1989 there was a variance. In 1990 the house was built. So this will allow the third generation, third plus <laughs> generation, to actually live on the property something that their family started a number of years ago. So uh, with that, we certainly do have a lot of information in the packet. We'd certainly be willing to discuss anything with you and do understand that there's a lot of information to be provided and a lot to be read. So thank you. Let me start with... Uh, not from Pixel Why don't I have a few... Mr. Lawrence, what the town sees? Yes, as I as I put in my uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, as I put in my staff comments, which you, you should have all received. Um, it, it on the outside seems like a simple request, but there are a lot of layers and a lot of uh, a lot of complexities to it um, that were not necessarily anyone's fault, not certainly not the owners. But um, it's interesting to hear about the requirement. Um, I didn't read all of the minutes for the prior um, appeal that was granted for the construction of the building, but it seems they actually did you a, di a disservice by making you put it so far back on the lot. Um, it would have been more in keeping with all of the rest of the structures on on 
on the street, if I can get to it here. I mean, as you look up and down the street on Morning Street, all of the houses are close to the street. In in this one, they made they made them put it back in order to approve the the variance, which I, I of course, I, you know, I, I don't want to be a Monday morning quarterback, but it just seems like that was really the wrong thing to do. Um, and so, you know, in order to get a structure of any kind, they had to abide by the board's conditions, and that's what they came up with, I guess. Um, having said that, um, one of the questions that um, Nancy and I talked about a little bit um, uh, as, as um, did we with, um, with Jeff, I believe, is, is what is the primary frontage? Because with the new Higgins Beach character code, you have a primary frontage <coughs> and you have a secondary frontage on a corner lot. And that really, I guess, could be determined by the applicant themselves uh, if they wanted to designate a primary and a secondary frontage. I felt that because of the code's requirement that a secondary frontage be 12 to 21 feet from the street, they meet that secondary frontage on Greenwood, but they don't on Morning. And since their address is on Morning Street, the driveway is on Morning Street, my opinion, and it's just my opinion, is that Morning Street provides the primary frontage for the house, which they, can't, they don't meet and can't meet, but they do meet the secondary frontage. So it really just leaves them with the Greenwood, uh, excuse me, with the, um, the rear of the house, which has to be 30 feet, and that would be the, the back property line opposite the Morning Street property line. They can't meet that one because they're <coughs> because of the placement of the house and how the board uh, apparently the board of appeals had them place the house back in 1990. And they but they do meet the setback between themselves and uh, number 38 Morning Street. So that that side setback is fine as Nancy went through. So the the least amount of nonconformance I think comes if you designate Morning Street as your primary frontage. As Nancy described, the issue is that then to do any expansion, if you could imagine just for a minute, if the house was placed 18 to 21 feet from Morning Street, okay, then the sunroom addition or any kind of addition would happen to the rear of the property where the structure now exists, um, still leaving a 30-foot setback. So it's almost like a reverse I think what they're what they're proposing to do, you could almost look at it as a reversed rear addition, and they're flopping it over and they're putting it on the front because of the placement of the structure. There isn't any way that this house really meets a lot of any of the standards that are in the character-based code. The roof um, design isn't really a character-based element. There's no gambrel roof. Um, roof pitch requirements or anything. Gambrel is not even mentioned in, in the character-based code. There's no way they can really put a front porch on the structure. Well, I shouldn't say that. They, they could put a front porch on the structure, but they'd still need to come for a variance for that. What they're proposing doesn't really, doesn't really look like a front porch to me, so <coughs> it doesn't really act like a front porch. It doesn't behave like a front porch. It behaves more like a rear addition. To be a true rear addition on the front of the house, it would have to be inset from both corners of the house and not just one corner. So there's some character-based elements we'd need to talk about with just exactly what is this addition. But there are some other subcomponents there that do seem to be pretty, uh, do seem to mirror pretty closely the standards in the character-based code. The number one is the canopy uh, entrance, if I can get to it here. Um, the canopy entrance that you see right here, um, if you're looking at my cursor moving around, uh, that, that could be a character-based ele element. It, it's actually a stoop with a canopy over it. And then the roof, what, what I believe they're referring to as a roof deck, we would uh, actually call a, um, um, a balcony. It meets our definition of a balcony, and uh, I think that would meet the character-based code. Uh, requirements as well. So when we run into, if you remember the um, the case of the, the 48 Bayview property that was a little 50 by 50 lot with a very plain cottage style home on it, um, there really wasn't any way they could meet all the character-based codes, but they kind of hinted at a lot of them. 
and this is kind of one of those situations where you, you, you take what you can get and try to make, make it meet the character-based elements if you can. It's a long-winded explanation or narrative that I just gave you, but it, what I'm getting at or trying to get to is that the board's duty, I think, tonight is to simply go through the criteria for the practical difficulty variance and look at this as an addition of some kind. We don't really know how, what to categorize it as, but it isn't an, an addition. And in order to do the addition, the only place they can do it logically is where they're proposing to do it. <coughs> Similarly to the last appeal that you just heard, it, it's an allowed or permitted use to do that in this district if it meets the character-based standards. And there, and there are going to be instances where existing buildings cannot do that because of their prior placement on the lot. Um, it's unrealistic. <coughs> Well, I guess I shouldn't say that. It's the board's decision to say, is it infeasible for them to pick this building up and move it, leaving behind a perfectly good crawl space foundation that was just poured in 1990? Do you just abandon that and, and bring it forward and do this in a compliant way? Is that a feasible alternative, or do you allow them to add four more feet uh, of framing to the foundation and elevate the house and then just put this addition on it where it currently exists? So the boards probably just focus on the dimensional um, relief that's being requested, but with an eye and maybe even placing condition that if, if the board should so grant this relief, that the applicant would still be beholding to try to meet the character-based code as far as the design elements of the house to the greatest extent possible. It's going to be almost impossible to meet them 100%, but that's not your job to to determine that, it's your job to determine if the dimensional relief makes sense and if you can approve that if it meets the criteria in the practical difficulty variance. And your board will be dealing, I mean, your office will deal with We deal with the rest of the characters. Yeah, the character based stuff. Because there, I mean, there are discussion points here that I won't get into in great detail, but there's things such as fenestration, there's things such as the, the setbacks in the corner, if we're going to consider it sort of the reverse rear uh, addition. There's all these talking points that we, we can work with the applicant on and come to some, some kind of an agreement on them. If it, if it sort of gets to the code but maybe doesn't get there 100%, we have some leeway to do that through our administrative review. It's not, I don't think it's fair to put the board in a situation of trying to weigh all that stuff out. I think simply looking at the practical difficulty variance from a dimensional perspective is the best way to go. Should you feel it doesn't meet those criteria, obviously you can't grant the variance. If you do grant the variance, then we'll deal with the, the character-based code elements. And that well, sounds fair. That makes sense. Thank you very much for that clarity. Is it, is, is in the extra space, does that cause any problems with it? doesn't look like it would, but just to clarify, that's not an issue regarding coverage, lot coverage? Or uh, no. No, it's not because uh, one of the reasons, it's, it's almost a given, if they come for a practical difficulty variance, they aren't under any of the shoreland zoning regulations for lot coverage, and they aren't in any, uh, they're not in a floodplain. They're simply elevating to get a basement, a uh, full, full size basement. So if, if they weren't doing a practical difficulty variance, then there's probably a reason for that, and it's likely that there's shoreland <laughs> implications or some other constraints on the lot that, yeah, we'd, we'd have to look at those elements. Right now, it's the dimensional standards of the building, and just for the board's information, the existing size of the structure with the proposed addition, whatever you want to call it, but the, the building addition does not exceed what could normally be permitted without any board action if it were reversed and the, the building were located in a compliant position on the lot. So it, it doesn't exceed the lengths or the widths or any of those dimensional standards that are in the character base code. And is this a two-story unit? right now or is that now? That's a great question. I had to look at that a little bit today because of the definitions in the character base code. If there is five feet of wall above grade, then the basement would then become a story. And this, I think, fits the, the, the house character, the house style. It's the house style, not the cottage style or the bungalow style. So it's a house style. The house style allows two and a half stories. The definition of a half story is that the it's the the half story is the space under the roof framing. 
because it's a Gambrel style, um, it doesn't really matter if it's Gambrel or not. The roof framing would have to meet um, the wall at no more than two feet above the uh, the floor area, or the so so. If you look at the Gambrel roof, it basically comes down and connects at the top of the second floor, or would be the, the first full floor above grade. So it meets the definition of two and a half stories. Um, the only thing I don't have, and I think this is a good point, maybe Nancy can answer, the appellant can answer it. We don't have a we don't have a designated total height proposed height of the structure, which we'd probably need to talk mm -hmm. about. <clears throat> we know that you want to add four feet to it, but we don't know what it is now. <laughs> we don't know what it'll be at the at, at the end after everything's done. steps aren't in the equation because that's allowed in the new rules. Right. And the other thing I'm not 100% sure of because it wasn't dimensioned on the plan is, 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 it, is there five feet above grade? We know you're adding four feet. If you look at the section, it shows four feet from the top of the wall. I can actually enlarge that a little bit for. So down here, if you see the the section through the home, they're they're showing a four foot increase from the top of the wall to the bottom of the first floor framing. But we don't know what this dimension is from the finished floor of the first floor flame framing down to grade. If that dimension is, is five feet or more, then it is this basement is considered a story. So it becomes one of the one of the uh, two and a half stories that they're allowed. If it weren't five feet, if it was only three feet, this basement would actually be free for them. They wouldn't it wouldn't count towards the two and a half stories. But at this point it's still well, even if it was counted, it doesn't matter because they meet the two and a half. Correct. That's correct. So from my watch point of view, it, five feet is irrelevant. It's irrelevant, except we just don't know if it counts or not. But it's it's good either way. Yeah. Clarify that. Did you ever take the microphone? State your name. We just can't hear over over the. Um, Jeff McKenzie, Farmer's Ms. Barrows. To clarify uh, your question, are you asking if the floor down through the joist to the top of the new plate, you want that dimension? That one's not as that one's not as important as the total height of the building because we don't that's not dimension and we don't know what the total height of the building is going to be. I'd rather know that one. I'm not so concerned about as we just said. I think that's going to be counted as a story because it looks like it's more than five feet. It's just not dimensioned. Okay. But it doesn't matter. What does matter is the height of the building. If we add the four feet as proposed, yeah, for, I came for, up with 24.3 feet. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. You're allowed 35. We just want to make sure you're under there and it's not dimensioned. I was okay. pretty sure it was under it, but right. again, right. I couldn't scale it because graciously I got, a, I got this wonderfully large plan here that... <laughs> When it's reduced, the scale doesn't work on it anymore. <coughs> I'm sure that was a Rosbera cost-cutting measure. <laughs> uh, but but anyway, I couldn't scale it just what, what I was getting at. So it, without a dimension on there, it could, I had no idea, but I'm guessing it's well under 35. So that's, that, those were only the, the, the points that I could find on that. Again, I'm, I've taken up way too much time. So no, you have back to this. This, is, this saved us a lot of time in the long run. So thank you. All right. So why don't we go through the uh, requirements? Please, uh, Nancy, if that's okay. Sure. The uh, need of variance is due to the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions in the neighborhood. 
so our responses are paraphrased from our very extensive letter, but hopefully it will uh, will provide enough information coupled with the prior review of the letter. So the site is unique and challenged due to the lot's limited dimensions and overall geometry, along with the fact that it's a corner lot. The location of the existing cottage on the westerly end of the lot, built under a 1989 variant, is unique compared to the lots in the vicinity and is further away from Morning Street. With the new municipal CR1 zoning, the site now has a 30-foot, quote-unquote, rear yard setback along the westerly sideline. This was formerly 15 feet. Yet this was the spot that the cottage was constructed under the prior variance. The corner lot now includes two minimum and maximum front yard setbacks. Given the location of the cottage, it's not practicable to meet the maximum standards. And the cross-reference to the cover letter, uh, as we mentioned, has a lot more information about that. And the granting of the variance will not re uh, produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or the fair market value of abutting properties. The use of the property as the applicant's permanent residence in their retirement will not change the character of the neighborhood as the area is surrounded by single-family residences and seasonal cottages. The proposed changes are expected to increase the property value of the site by constructing a full basement area beneath the existing cottage rather than a crawl space. The addition of a new sunroom and deck will add new building elements that are very common in this neighborhood and are an extremely desirable amenity in this coastal area. These improvements are expected to increase the overall value of this property and those on the surrounding area. And the practical difficulty is not a result of an action taken by the applicant or the prior owner? The recent rezoning of the area to CR1 has changed the required setbacks. The new setbacks place approximately half of the existing cottage within the, quote, rear yard along the westerly property line. The new ordinance standards also include a maximum primary front yard setback as well as a minimum setback. The existing cottage is in excess of the maximum allowable setback from Morning Street. Any work to this cottage requires a practical difficulty variance to address the setback issues on both ends of the property. Had the municipal ordinance changes not occurred in 2015, the proposed building addition and renovations could have been completed with no need to expand upon the reductions previously permitted with the 1989 variance. These ordinance changes which necessitate this practical difficulty variance were not conducted by the applicant or their ancestors. And no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except the variance. The new rear setback crosses roughly through the midpoint of the existing cottage. The distance between <coughs> Morning Street and the existing cottage far exceeds the requisite maximum primary front yard setback. These issues apply to the existing cottage regardless of whether any renovations or additions occur. In order to comply with a 30-foot rear yard setback on the westerly end of the site, approximately half of the existing cottage would need to be removed in its entirety. This would result in a significant loss of the existing cottage and would not be feasible or practicable. In order to comply with the maximum 21-foot setback from Morning Street, an addition in excess of approximately 34 feet in width would be necessary to address the maximum primary front setback. This would more than double the existing width of the cottage and would not be feasible. The cost of this scale of an addition would far exceed the expected cost of the proposed 12 by 22 sunroom addition. And the granting of the variance uh, will result in bringing the, prop the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with the surrounding properties. The home is to the west of the property. The home to the west of the property is approximately the same distance from Greenwood Avenue as the applicant's existing cottage. Using the GIS <coughs> database, the residence to the south appears to be approximately 24 feet from Morning Street. With the proposed renovations, the setbacks along the westerly and southerly property limits will not change. The proposed sunroom addition will bring the front wall closer to Morning Street. <coughs> Although the residence is located outside of the maximum primary front setback, the proposed addition will bring the home more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. And the granting of the grants will not have an adverse effect on the natural environment? The lot is an existing developed residential property with town streets on two sides and an additional residential lots on the remaining sides. 
The site is not located with any, within any identified sensitive natural areas. It's not located within or adjacent to any protected back dunes or frontal bones, erosion hazard areas, flood hazard zones, or other protected natural areas. The proposed renovations to raise the cottage will not increase the overall footprint of the existing cottage. The proposed addition of a sunroom will affect an approximately 264 square foot portion of the lot. A portion of the proposed expansion area is currently a paved walk with the remaining area grass. The area outside of the expansion, with the exception of the driveway, will remain a lawn area. The granting of the variance is not expected to have an unreasonable adverse effect on the natural environment. And you're not in the flood zone. The property is not in within a special flood hazard zone as shown on the firm map. Thank you. Um, we have one letter. Two phone calls reading. I'll, I'll read the letter into the record. Uh, this is uh, from. Thank you. It's from uh, Kathleen Hohannon, 76 Patriots Road, Morris Plains, New Jersey. And uh, it reads as follows. Dear Tom, several days ago we received a notification from the Scarborough Zoning Board that your petition for a variance would be heard this coming Wednesday evening, November 9th. As co-owners of the adjacent property at night 38 Morning Street, my brother Thomas Houle and I discussed the proposal. We don't wish to oppose your plans, but we do have concerns about the project's potential impact on our property. It appears from the diagram provided in the zoning board that the original structure built in 91 or 92 was less than 9 feet from our property line. The addition to the structure will maintain that small 9-foot variance from the line, unlike the original structure. However, it will diminish the privacy we uh, have heretofore had in our kitchen and bedroom areas because your proposed sunroom will be directly adjacent. We have more than adjoining properties, uh, I'm sorry, we have more than adjoining properties at Higgins Beach in common. Our common ancestors settled at Higgins Beach as some of the first renters, quote unquote, of Mr. Higgins' land more than 125 years ago. We were very fond of your late father and enjoyed getting to know you a uh, little last summer. So we are your relatives as well as your neighbors. All we ask is that you be aware of our privacy concerns so, so that you and your wife are able to enjoy a nice summer without us having negative impact on our quality of life. We ask that you respect our common privacy needs by making sure that the new structure does not encroach further on the common property line, and we would like to discuss planning a privacy hedge of some, some kind on the property line that will provide both a line of dem uh, demarcation and some privacy between the two properties. We would, of course, share the cost of the planning. I am sending out a copy of the email to Brian Longstaff at the Scarborough Zoning Board so that our concerns are expressed in some form before the Zoning Board meeting uh, of, of your hearing. Uh, with all good wishes, Kathy, it's from Thomas Hull and Kathy Hull Hannon. Uh, Thomas Hull is 310 Williams, Williams Salisbury Drive in uh, Downington, Pennsylvania. And uh, Kathleen Gould and from 76 Patriots Road, Morris Plains, New Jersey. And, uh, and I want to open the uh, public hearing. Anybody wish to speak on this subject from the public? Seeing nobody from the public wish to speak, I'll close the public hearing part of this meeting. Um, come back to the uh, board with questions or comments. Has, uh, has anyone approached the neighbors uh, who have this, these concerns to, to see what might be done there to, to alleviate any, any uh, privacy issues? Uh, until tonight, I wasn't aware of the letter. So um, have you had any discussions? Not at this point. Um, I guess the easiest answer to that question would be is, are, are there windows on that side of the property, uh, of, the, of, the, of the building? See that there are. And we're not encroaching as it, as it reads. And yeah, I'm just trying to address their concerns because good neighbors uh, live longer. Um, the side there. 
Uh, we're not encroaching any more than the nine feet staying in that window, so it's coming straight down. Uh, the windows themselves, uh, I don't know what they have to, how they have to feel about that. Uh, whether or not they are interested at all in not putting the leaves in or not. Uh, I think it's probably pretty I'm assuming that uh, you received the letter earlier and have thought about it at least. If you'd like to take the microphone. Mr. Chairman, if I could also point out, um, with the zoning criteria that is currently in place, the existing building and the proposed addition would not be in the setback along that side property line. It was only in the setback in the original variance with the rezoning that happened in 2015. There's an eight-foot side yard requirement for all the lots in this district, and we are outside of that, even with the addition. Thanks for the clarification. And I'm not saying that I'm looking for this answer. I'm just trying to get a feel of where we're at. Yeah. Uh, Tom Roach from Portland, uh, the applicant. Uh, let me see. No, I have not discussed it or thought about uh, not putting a window in there. That is the southerly side of the house, so you do have a lot of sun coming in that area. Um, I would be hesitant to, to not put a window in there just because of the fact of the sunlight. There is massive trees there, um, so there is a lot of shade in the yard too as well. So I wouldn't mind keeping the window there and, and having the light. I have discussed um, with her this summer putting a small hedge up. So that was her idea. Uh, there was a lot of growth in there. I've taken a lot of the growth out. And um, you know, she said, can we put a little small fence in and a little hedge with a little fence in there? And I said, yeah, no problem at all. We can do with that. Um, but, I'm, you know, I, depending on the situation, I'm not opposed to, to helping her out and meeting her needs. Have you had any contacts with her since the letter? No, I have not, no. As a matter of fact, I just, I op just uh, got the letter on Monday on my email. I just opened it up this morning. So Maybe with a phone call. Phone call. Sure. Uh, your call, but that's just my, right. my advice. Um, and I'd like to note as well that the applicant is willing to work with the neighbor to you know, smooth over any issues that the neighbor has, whether it's coordinating a planting or um, something like that. So I think it's good to note. Other board member comments? Uh, why don't I put in the, the practical difficulty comment on here? Uh, the case for the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which the variance is sought would both preclude a use of the property which is permitted in the zone in which it is located and also would result in significant economic injury to the applicant would also apply here, is that correct? Yes. Um, so that needs to weigh in on a deliberation. Feel free to jump in and do comments or questions. No, no, other, no other questions. Um, the envelope now, and I'm a little confused about the new envelope versus the old envelope. The, the new envelope is <coughs> eight feet side, is that right? The principal structure can be as close as eight feet on a side setback. But um, we've got because we've got a because you've got two frontages in the character-based code now. And I agree, your your to me the address where the mail is delivered is the front. That would be seem logical. It it only seems logical to me because it then if you tr if you chose. Greenwood Avenue as the primary frontage, you don't meet it there because you're only 14 feet <laughs> from the right of way, and you don't meet it on the Morning Street side because you're still you still got that problem. So now you've created two nonconformances, and you have a rear setback problem as well. So you've got three nonconformances. Whereas if you choose Morning Street, you decide with the with the driveway and the address that and the rear are the only two. You, you narrowed it down to two nonconformances, and that's why, to me, it makes more sense to, to go with the Morning Street side. Again, it's, if you look at the, if you look at the, um, the building, um, taking Google Earth here, you, you could make a case that, if I can get out there on Greenwood Street, 
you can make a case that that looks like it could be a front, you know, of a building, but it's it's kind of hidden by trees, and it's clearly I I would guess that the you don't use that as a main entrance to the house very much, so it just doesn't make to me make a lot of sense to call that. So there's two right now that if you call Morning Street to primary frontage, there's two nonconformances. The eight foot setback is being met on that line between 38 and 40 Morning Street, the bottom the bottom property line on your sheet. That one's being met. This one is not being met because there's a 30 foot rear setback. But they're asking here just we need to do this just because they're going up. That's the only reason that we're adding that in is because they're elevating by more than a foot the structure and our policy is if you elevate by more than a foot unless it's for floodplain requirements, then you're you're increasing the non conform non conforming non conforming aspect of the building by elevating it vertically. Okay. And so the you kinda gotta throw that in there. Um, right now, again, the front setback is being met. The, the, this one is not. This one is, and this one is not. So, um, and this side here, where the road is, it's the secondary. How many feet off does that have to be? That we it, it can be a range of 12 to 21. So it allows you to get closer to the the, the secondary. Uh, so street. they're in the, they're in that envelope. Yeah, yeah they're they're nicely in the envelope that way. Um, it's the rear setback and the front setback on Morning Street that are the two that they're, they're not meeting. In the old envelope, uh, it was a 30-foot front setback um, and 15 feet side and rear, and so they had a 30-foot on green Greenwood and a 30-foot on Morning, which they couldn't meet because of the lot size at the time and the setbacks at the time. And Nancy, the, the 12 feet that, that's coming out. Does that get to the back of the house that's beside them that we're talking about? Does that get all the way back there? It seems like it's a larger spread than that. Well, I think I think that house is still forward of that. So, so it's still forward. It's to the back stoop. Okay, it is to the back stoop of the house. Okay, and you're gonna be above them. Is that a single-story home or is that a two-story home? Yeah. Old style uh, bedroom upstairs. Okay. Um, let's go through each one of these uh, requirements from the board. So the general need for the variance is due to the unique circumstance of the property and not to the general conditions of the uh, uh, neighborhood. And uh, we have volunteers who would like to start. I mean, I think Brian went into pretty good detail yeah. about the situation that the town kind of put them in and where they situated their house. And why they're here today. Okay, well, we'll just continue right down the line. Uh, I concur, Karen. I mean, the the note that Brian was mentioning regarding the variance that was given in 1989 sort of put them in this position, so they're kind of stuck where they are now. Um, and they, they need to have a variance because of uh, the where the location where the house was constructed. It's clearly a unique property, um, but I think a lot of that a lot of that uniqueness does come from the prior zoning board placing it placing there the, the building uh, where it is currently. So uh, it certainly wasn't the fault of the of the property owners. Yeah, I don't think it's it seems like the zoning board created part of this issue with what we're looking at now. I wasn't on the zoning board at that point. <laughs> Been here uh, I agree. Uh, <laughs> well, he's been here since there was one. Uh, he, <laughs> he was. He actually just doesn't want to be a chat member. Uh, needs to be to do the unique circumstances of the property and not to the general conditions of the neighborhood. I think it's obviously true. So uh, all in favor that number one is met. Unanimous. Number two. The granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonably detrimental effect on either the use or the fair market value of abutting properties. I mean, I think this is consistent with the applications we're seeing for Higgins Beach, the improvements of the property, making them more year-round and, and livable. And, um, I mean, it's just going to increase the value of the property and the surrounding properties as well. Right. They're adding new... Um, features and elements of the building, like the sunroom and the deck that, like, uh, as a state in the application, are very common to the other houses in the neighborhood. 
I, I think even though there isn't a, uh, any, anything regarding gambrel roofs, roofs in the ordinance down there, I think that the new addition that they're looking to put on uh, does uh, follow the standards that we're looking for and uh, makes it a little bit more conforming and it gets it closer to that setback, uh, the maximum setback that we're looking for. I, I don't see any undesirable change that makes it more conforming with what's down there. and it's. I mean, you have a variety of different houses. So the granting of the variance will not produce an undesirable change in the character of the neighborhood and will not have an unreasonable detrimental effect on either the use of the fair market value of abutting properties. Um, I think you can make an argument for um, privacy issues, but there is the challenge with that is when you live down there, I don't think there's any privacy. That's awfully close, no matter what. Whether it's 16 feet or eight or whatever, it's it's, it's going to be close. And I'm glad that it's behind. It doesn't meet the side of the house. So I'm fine with that. All in favor of two being met. Yes. Practical difficulty is not the result of an action taken by the applicant or prior owner. I think we've discussed this at length. No, it's not. That was the result of the ZBA in 1989. I think uh, regulations and everything was different back then when the when the current zoning board uh, had to deal with this issue. So it was just a situation at the time. <coughs> yeah, I don't see it was anything from the current or prior owner. And practical difficulty is not a result in action taken by the applicant or prior owner. Uh, I will defend our previous, the ancestors of the zoning board, and say they were very wise in where they put it. Based on the information they had at the time, and we were I on the fence for them and the rest of the boys. So all yeah, in favor? Yeah. I just want to go on record, Mr. Chairman. I wasn't criticizing the former. <laughs> <laughs> You're okay. It's all the others. <laughs> yeah. no You're criticize you. <laughs> uh, no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except the variance. Mr. Continue with you. Um, yeah, I was going to say, because of the constraints of the law, I mean, you're basically using the only space they have there. Right, and anything else they would like to try there, as mentioned earlier, would result in, you know, a significant economic injury to themselves to try to do something else. So this really is their only option if this is what they want to go forward with. Yeah, I'd, I'd have to agree. There are other alternatives, but uh, they would, they would uh, clearly have some economic issues with that. Normally, this is one I would say no on, um, but Mr. Longstaff pointed out there is a feasible alternative, but due to the neighbor's request for privacy, that in a way supersedes the feasible alternative because if it was brought forward, it would be more into what the neighbors would see and less privacy for them, so I think that probably makes it a little bit more on, on the level of no feasible alternative being available. And, I mean, we don't look at it, I don't think, generally for monetary anyways. So that wouldn't be an issue for me. I wouldn't be looking at the monetary-wise. If there was a feasible alternative, I would say it wouldn't be. Wouldn't be other than the neighbor <coughs> has some concerns about privacy. That's the only thing that would allow me to say yes to this. And so no other feasible alternative is available to the applicant except the variance. Uh, I agree with the board. I don't see uh, there are other alternatives, um, but they the envelope, it, it seems reasonable that it, that it would be acceptable. Mr. Chairman, I would just add, um, although the neighbors may express concerns over privacy, uh, privacy is not a, it's not a requirement. Um, there's no standard for privacy. Um, all of the houses, in fact, they're, they're just as close to the, the next house down as this house would be to them. So I, I don't get the privacy thing. I understand it's a concern. Mm -hmm. But I don't think the board should tread into that area as making that a justification for no feasible alternative. The board certainly is within its rights to say, listen, if you want to put that addition on, you pick the house up, you pour a new foundation in a compliant manner, and you plunk the new house and its addition on there, and instead of the sunroom, you put a, a porch on there like what's required on all the other. You could say that. You could, you could, that could be your position. The question is, is that financially feasible? Is that posing a financial hardship according to the definition that says would both preclude a use of the property and would also result in significant economic injury. So that's the question. 
is making this compliant significant economic injury to the applicant? That's the question you need to ask. Don't bother yourself <laughs> with the privacy thing because you'll never win that battle anyway. It's a, it's a, it's a loss. Now, it's always one of those things to yeah. me It's just a, a relationship thing as opposed to a reality thing. And, it's, and it doesn't, it meets it. So I feel comfortable with number four, if no feasible alternative, all in favor. Uh, the granting of the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more nearly into conformance with surrounding properties. I think as we've discussed, a lot of the houses in that neighborhood are closer to, to, the, to the street. And so it'll be bringing it closer to the street in conformity with the new zoning laws as well. I agree. I mean, it's, it's, it's stated and it's shown on the drawing that the proposed addition will bring the home more into conformance with the <coughs> properties. I would have to agree with the comments previously made. Yeah, I mean, raising it up, a lot of the homes that have come before us, they're either raising it up to put it for for flood if they're close to the water or they're putting basements underneath them. So we've seen a lot of these coming that way. So I would agree. So the variance will result in bringing the applicant's property more newly into conformance with surrounding properties. Um, I, I, I look at it as kind of a shallow question to be candid in most cases. And here it, it doesn't, whether it does or doesn't, it doesn't hurt it. it so I'm fine with it. Uh, so number five, all in favor? That's unanimous. Number six, the granting of the variance will not have an ad unreasonably adverse effect on the natural environment. I think so. No. No, they're not. Uh, they're not really uh, going to be having a lot more impervious area there. No, no, I, I don't see any any issues there. No, and I think there's been discussion between the, the neighbor and the applicant for putting a barrier in there anyways, even adding to the natural environment. And Nancy, you've done the studies on the salamanders, the spotted salamanders, and the uh, owls that dig in the ground that have been correctly studied, and also rabbits? <laughs> Not on this site, sir. <laughs> Snowshoe rabbits. I, I <laughs> agree that. Sorry, I couldn't read it. Um, I think it does... Um, there's no unreasonable no uh, effect on the natural environment. All in favor? Actually, I must we know that it's not in the flood zone. The last question to be met, probably the hardest one, uh, is a case uh, where the strict application of the dimensional standards of the ordinance to the property for which the variance is sought would both preclude the use of the property which is permitted in the zone and which is located and also would result in significant economic injury <coughs> to the applicant. Ms. Schuch, you on that one. Well, I mean, I think we discussed the idea of, I mean, to become in, to conform would be to move the house, and that's not economically feasible or reasonable for us to ask the applicant to do that. I agree. I would agree with that as well. Yes, I would agree. <coughs> and I'm in the same place with the practical difficulty. All in favor of that being <coughs> That's unanimous. So as far as the board is concerned, does anybody have any other questions, comments, or a motion? Move to approve as, uh, as submitted. Second. Any discussions on the motion? Mr. Chairman, I might want to condition that upon um, the applicant's meeting the um, character-based component standards. Could you? Um, that's, that's really the point. Would you amend your motion to sure. character base su subject to the approval of the CEO? Sure, that would be uh, subject to the approval of the CEO. Um, and uh, I, I think if there are any uh, questions on that, you can certainly get together with the CEO and he'll help you out with that. Okay, with and that, that typically he likes uh, Robin Egg Blue for the roof. Um, so would that amendment change the on approval of the, yeah, let me first say, uh, we have a motion on the amendment to the the uh, or the original motion. Seven. So basically, I'm looking for approval for the the. Yeah, I move to approve the amendment as the amendment. stated by Mr. Stark. Thank you. And uh, I need a second. Yeah. A second that. Second that. Say that I have Okay. So based on the new motion, uh, all in favor? 
that should end this. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a great day. We, we have a, I think as you discussed, we have a carryover from um, a tabled uh, application that will be heard in December, and we'll also have, um, we had a third application that came in that was a, a, a miscellaneous appeal for an expansion of a non-conforming use. If you recall, that requires planning board advisory opinion. The planning board schedule did not coincide with our schedule uh, because they're on a three-week schedule instead of us and so the applicant couldn't meet their deadline for submittal <clears throat> so she'll be going to the planning board um, in December prior to coming here uh, so there'll be two that we know of for next month but there may be more okay, okay. Um, any other comments from board members uh, I have a comment. Uh, unfortunately, I will not be uh, in attendance at next month's board meeting. I have Come a on. conflict with my work. And, I was unable to get out and I'm not certain that I'll be here either. Come on. That's important to know. So we'll need four. We'll, uh, just for the record, for anybody that, that's listening for about next, uh, December's meeting, there may not be enough to have a quorum at that meeting. If there is, we'll reschedule the best that we can. So. We'll see we don't know about the other two members. Um, Everybody have a happy Thanksgiving. That's a, yeah, that's a pretty good point, Thanksgiving. Uh, I'd like to bring up something that I think is really important, and it's been, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking, uh, as this is a bully pulpit, be candid with you, I'm going to ask the board to kind of uh, hear what this issue is, and also uh, we as a town have no ability to manage it. And I find it offensive, to be candid with you, but regarding the issue, I think it's a big of a deal. Back in 2000, the town decided to help people that could not afford to have homes or wanted to take loved ones in and have an efficiency apartment or uh, whatever you want to call it, in law apartment, to be allowed for two reasons. One is to get the ones that were illegal out from under the, the shade and be visible. And uh, because there were some of dangerous situations, especially down in the uh, Pine Point area, and also to uh, allow for people in an environment where it is very difficult, and we keep on talking, the rhetoric is over and over again of affordable housing, affordable housing, affordable housing, and in my opinion, it is rhetoric rather than rather than truth. And you probably sense a little bit of my frustration, and the reason why is because I wrote that ordinance, and it's been changed over the years uh, and never has it been known that the, or at least brought to my attention, certainly in the other planning, uh, the town councils I've asked, that the sewer district charges a $3,000 fee for the addition of a, at the time, 600 foot efficiency apartment. It's since been changed as to the size as it could be. But if you're on a sewer district, and they charge a monthly increase and see they treat it like a second home. Even though we specifically designed it, I'm sorry, as a two unit, even though we specifically at the time designed it as a non uh, two unit. It was never intended to be a two unit. It shouldn't have been treated as a two unit. In my opinion, I, I am very, very, very frustrated by the fact that the sewer district made the decision without going to the town. And the full intent was to make this affordability for the community and to make people come out from under the under the the, uh, the secrecy of these uh, these apartments, and I, I feel that's a violation of what the town council intended. It's certainly a violation of what I did. I'm doing a uh, the way I found out was I'm doing an expansion on my home. The planning department, the zoning department, the fees that are involved are minimal. The work to get it approved been minimal. There's been nothing but professional. There's been nothing but proper and and uh, the, the people that have been working with me on the project know the town's rules and have been fantastic. I got a phone call from the 
Code Enforcement Office saying, by the way, don't forget you need to go to the sewer district, which, to be honest with you, I just didn't know. I did. And I was informed that if I took the kitchen out, I wouldn't have to pay the exorbitant $3,000 fee. Now, $3,000 to me, I can survive $3,000. So it's not about me. And then on top of that, though, there's an increased monthly fee that goes along with it. So it's not just a $3,000 fee. It's on top of that. And what shocked me was that, oh, yeah, you can lower that if you get rid of the kitchen. And I'm sitting there going, that's an efficiency apartment. What in the world does a kitchen have to do with $3,000 of fees? If you want to make the argument for the bedroom, you have a legitimate debate. But for a kitchen, which... It's a house. And their argument is that it's a second unit, which is clearly in the ordinance not a two-unit efficiency apartment. What's the fee without the kitchen? You know, the answer I got at the time, I was a little bit surprised. And the person that told me about this was not a representative of the board. It was somebody that was really just stating it wasn't a person that I want to put under the gun because that person's role wasn't in that authority. And they got back to me with how it works and why it works. And the town has no ability to manage this organization. We just voted for two members yesterday. But we have no ability to manage them other than that vote. Their meetings are public. They are on TV, but most people don't hear about it. The town can't do anything. The planning board can't do anything. The zoning board can't do anything. They are an independent agency that has total control over their budget and how they manage things and what they charge. We have more control over what happens with the county than we do with our own sewer district. And not that I'm angry at any individual sewer district member, but I am extremely concerned that we sit here and we talk about affordable housing and keeping communities and families together, and we consistently do the exact opposite. And this is a classic example. It may only be $3,000 to somebody who makes good income, and they don't care. But to me, and then to have the reason be that it's a kitchen or a kitchenette, most cases these things are nothing more than a tiny refrigerator, a cabinet, a two-burner stove, and a dishwasher, which uses less water than a sink would use. And I find that I believe that needs to be addressed. And the only way I can get that out in the public is here because there is no other format. So I'm stating that on the record as I pointed out of the bully pulpit, and I would hope that others agree with me and make a phone call to the sewer district, and I hope they're as disgusted as I am because I really believed in that ordinance. And I've been told by the people at the sewer district that once they find out that they have to pay this $3,000 fee and additional quarterly fees, they choose not to do it. The statement that was made to me was many of them choose not to continue with the process. Now, I don't know what that means. They don't offer any sort of alternative, like, you know, come before the board, I can't pay $3,000, hardship sort of. No, it's the rule, get over it, deal with it. And I have... My feeling is that probably there are a number of people that continue with the work, but just tell them... I agree. That may be the case also. And, you know, I told the truth. I paid my $3,000, and now I'm making a lot of noise about my $3,000. It isn't my $3,000. I do not care about the money. I care about the principle of we speak one language in this town, and that's a direct insult to what that ordinance was built for. And that's my point. I would hope that all the board would make a phone call and not ask me to do that. But I think that the community needs to stand up and say, if you really believe in affordable housing, then allow affordable housing to be in this town. What about the housing authority? We have 
doesn't the government have a housing authority? I was on that they, board. The, was they do not have any jurisdiction over what the sewer district does. And the sewer district has total control over what but it they does. They should be working with them more if this is an issue. If they're the ones proposing affordable housing, because that's what they were doing back when I was on it, way back when. And, the you know, and then, you know. The challenge is if you don't know what happens, right. you know, they had to put that right. in place after we put that rule in. Is there a breakdown of that $3,000 for what it's for? Is it justified? Uh, it's, its argument is that you need to be able to have capacity for future growth. Well, again, I'd argue a bedroom would make that argument, but a kitchen sink doesn't seem to meet that standard. But the arbitrary rule is they, they seem to have decided that what we have declared as, well, as a town council, when I was on the town council declared, was not a second unit, but rather an efficiency unit, and we defined it differently intentionally. They seem to define it as a second unit, and that's charged I mean, appropriately. I mean, devil's advocate, I mean, it's capacity. It's how many people are using their system. So, I mean, they're just thinking, you know, efficiency or non-efficiency, you're adding two people to our system living in your house that are now going to be contributing and using but it every day. But I, and I can understand the, the 3000 if there weren't additional fees going along with it, by the way, if you're, if you're paying additionally for, for the monthly fees as well, that should cover the additional. And you're tapping into the same system. It's not as if you're tapping into the new line. And the fact is, in my case, I have a four-bedroom home. It's not going to be a five-bedroom home. If you wanted to argue the case, if the argument was that the bedroom is the trigger, we'd have something different to talk about. But the argument isn't that the bedroom is the trigger. The argument is that the kitchen is the trigger, which makes it comes back to the issue that they're treating it as a two-unit as opposed to a single unit. So there you go. I hope I, uh, I hope I offended some people and I hope I upset some people because I hope people make some phone calls because I think it's dead wrong. And uh, if that's anybody else wish to make any other comments, feel free. Yeah. We'll, we'll give you a variance. Calm down. What's that? We'll give you a variance. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. I have a motion to adjourn. Uh, motion to adjourn. I'll second that. All in favor? Thank you for my, uh, along my slow.